In this episode of Travelogue, I journey southwest to the great fog city of Chongqing. I'll discover how one of China's hilliest cities overcame its transportation disadvantages with some ingenious and breathtaking solutions and became a massive economic hotspot. Chongqing is definitely not an ordinary city. It's so crisscrossed by mountains and rivers that you really wouldn't expect it to be so populated. But Chongqing is actually the most populated city in the entire country. It's also home to some really unique topography. And unlike a lot of cities that try to avoid the forces of Mother Nature during development, Chongqing has really leaned into it at every single turn and produced some amazing and really picturesque infrastructure. I'm Megan, and welcome to Chongqing. To get here, we hopped on a plane in Beijing and headed southwest. As it turns out, this inland city is uniquely situated. Chongqing is where the Jialing River and the Yangtze River intersect. And the water in the Yangtze River over here is yellow, but the water in the Jialing River over there is green. And I think what's really cool is over in that corner, there's a really clear line where the water is visibly green on one side and yellow on the other side, and that's where the waters are blending. Having these two rivers here has done a lot for Chongqing's economy over the years, and that's why these docks and piers are always really busy. A web of rivers snaking through towering mountains. Chongqing's stunning geography sets it apart from other Chinese cities. As gorgeous as the nature is here, back in the day, it created some navigational challenges. For decades, Chongqing's network of waterways was the main means of getting around. Both the people and the economy relied heavily on boats for transportation. As for getting across a river, though, well, that took a little creativity. Before Chongqing had so many bridges, people needed ways to get across the river, either via the water or the air. And that's why they built the Yangtze River Cableway. Let's cross the river. This is the only cross-river cableway in China that's still in everyday use. And even though there are bridges and sky trains that can get you to the other side today, I felt there was something nostalgic about letting a decades-old contraption float me through the air. I think this is really fast for a cable car. The view is really nice. It's foggy, but it's really nice. Fog is in the forecast most days of the year here. Hence the city's nickname, Udu, or Fog City. Sure gives things a mysterious quality. But lack of visibility never stopped sailors and traders from navigating here. And Chongqing built lots of docks to welcome them. As the city developed and other modes of transport became more popular, most of these docks fell out of use. But for a while, they were the gateways to the city. What do you think about Chongqing's culture makes it so unique and different? Like, it just feels different than Beijing or Shanghai, right? Yeah, uh, Chongqing is a very, you know, it's a very insular city. It's inside the belly of China and hasn't been exposed to foreign influences like the cities on the coast. 
and uh, so in that way, it's very, it's very Chinese. It retains lots of, of culture, and especially culture from the country, because lots of people in Chongqing are actually from the country. I mean, it's a very new developed city. So the vast majority of, of people that live here are from the surrounding uh, counties and areas. I think the Chongqing has kind of a country style feel. And I know for China, and I know that when they translate these, what I'm saying in the Chinese is going to be, uh, it's going to sound bad to Chinese ears. But I think in a, for Westerners, for Americans, mm -hmm. country is not a bad thing. You know? No, yeah. No. It's just comfortable, it's real, it's they are who they are, they don't really put on they don't pose, uh put on airs. Um and so they're just down to earth and real. Uh and I think Chongqing has that feel. Also, uh Chongqing you know have a Mato Wenhua, like the dock culture. Back in the day, uh Tsichiko was a really important port in Chongqing. Passengers and cargo were picked up and dropped off here, so it was kind of like the gateway into the city. Now it's not a port anymore, but there are tons of shops and restaurants here. So it's actually become one of the busiest tourist attractions in Chongqing, and also one of the most crowded. Tsuchiko has hardly seen a day when it wasn't crowded. Back when the docks were thriving, it was a place where sailors and laborers congregated. Come dinner time, after a long day's work, their thoughts would turn to a hearty meal. Their preference tended to be for something with plenty of oil and spice, giving birth to the hot flavors Chongqing cuisine is known for today. Clearly, the dockside culture is still alive. People from all walks of life gather together to enjoy some opera, food, and conversation over a cup or two of tea. In lots of ways, it's the same Tsuchiko it's always been, although with a rather modern twist and a lot more tourists. So the fact that Chongqing developed so fast is really kind of strange. It's like, it's a, it's kind of like a miracle because it shouldn't be this huge of a city in Chinese standards. There's, Chongqing is like the joker card of Chinese cities, you know, it's like the wild card, you know? Like, Chinese cities are always um, north, south, east, west, you know, yi huan, er huan, san huan, si huan, wu huan, like an onion, right? But Chongqing is like, it's, it's multipolar, and it's much more random than most Chinese cities, and, uh, it goes against lots of traditional Chinese building practices for cities. So the fact that that Chongqing is a huge city as it is because of the, the, the World War II, the capital, you know, and all that, and the, and the current uh, One Belt, One Road, uh, that all made Chongqing into the huge city it is today. The streets change and uh, buildings just sprout up out of the ground. Yeah. It's, yeah, it just, it changes year to year. Like one Chongqing year is five China years. You know? uh -huh. Like, it's time definitely moves faster here, and it's um, it's not as wild as it used to be. It was. It's still wild and raw, but it's not as wild as it used to be. Chongqing today may be fast-paced, but it hasn't let go of its roots. Back in 1891, Longmenhao Port opened up to foreign trade. The Western-style architecture here is something of an anomaly in Chongqing. Longmenhao Port was the earliest inland trading port in China, and it helped open up the western part of the country to economic opportunities. Uh, today, the area where the port once stood is the largest and most well-preserved historical site in urban Chongqing. In Longmenhao, there's a sense of time standing still. By opening up to international trade, Chongqing became a bridge between east and west. Since then, decades have passed, and Chongqing has evolved from trading port to economic powerhouse. Merchants no longer dock their ships here, but 
the area still symbolizes a source of the city's past economic prosperity. It's also a reminder that without its rivers, Chongqing wouldn't be the thriving metropolis it is today. Coming up next, I get to experience Chongqing's solutions for getting around in a city of slopes, and they're pretty clever. Superficially, Chongqing may present the appearance of a concrete jungle, but there's an earthy quality to it that gives it a more rugged vibe than other major cities. Constricted by the local topography, the city's urban sprawl is very much integrated into the natural terrain, and its residents live in neighborhoods tucked among rivers, peaks, and greenery. Of course, Chongqing's hilliness does create its share of navigational challenges. In a city that seems to have more mountains than flat terrain, navigating from point A to point B is rarely straightforward. You can pretty much forget about north, south, east, and west. The locals navigate in terms of up and down, left and right. The hills make biking out of the question, so lots of residents simply walk. As for climbing staircases, well, it's an inescapable part of daily life here. One thing's for sure, my calves are getting a great workout. So because Chongqing is so hilly, people had to find ways to make getting around easier. And one of those solutions was this escalator. And this is the second longest escalator in Asia. It's considered part of the public transportation system. You have to swipe a card and now we're in. It's really fast too. Oh wow, that is so steep. I feel like I'm on a roller coaster. Like I'm about to go up Splash Mountain or something. I feel like this is one of those escalators where you should probably obey the hold the handrail sign because it would be a long way to fall. 
I did feel some vertigo trying to read the advertisements speeding past. When the escalator ride is 112 meters long, maybe don't try reading. It's a really ingenious solution if you think about it. It saves all the effort of having to climb or drive or you can just <laughs> let a machine do the work for you. But even machines have their limitations. Chongqing's topography meant building a subway was virtually impossible. So urban planners took to the skies. In a hilly megacity with numerous skyscrapers and limited space, this meant getting innovative. Wow, that is such a crazy sight. That train is literally going straight through the building. I mean, imagine looking outside your window every day and seeing a train just shooting past. It is a really ingenious solution to Chongqing's public transportation issues, though. If you can't build around the mountain, build through one of the buildings on it, I guess. And I think what's really incredible is that this railway stop has actually turned into a major tourist attraction. I mean, look how many people there are here taking pictures of the SkyTrain. That's so unbelievable. I was pretty amazed at how surprisingly quiet the train here at Lidzba Station is. With the help of noise reduction equipment, the building's occupants are actually no more disturbed than they would be by a dishwasher. So don't worry, their dreams aren't haunted every night by the sound of train tracks. Instead, they get to enjoy having a train station in their very own building. And an easy commute sure beats climbing hills. And the view is pretty spectacular. Tourists actually take Chongqing's public transportation as a way to do some sightseeing. You'll see tour groups from all over the country just riding around on the SkyTrain. So that's what we're going to do too. Clearly, the designers of Chongqing's SkyTrain system were wearing several hats. Urban planner and transport manager, of course, but also tour guide. By taking account of the scenery, they could design the system in a way that offered the finest views. Obviously, the best way to appreciate all the contours of this 3D city is from above. But a driver at this interchange probably won't get to pay much attention to the views. Five layers, 20 lanes, eight different directions. Sounds pretty chaotic. If you're using GPS, it'll probably fail you here. But while it may seem like a labyrinth, this interchange was designed to make traffic flow more smoothly. And for those who miss their ramp, there's always a turnaround just a short way ahead. Yep, the infrastructure here pretty much proves when there's a will, there's a way. Coming up next, I get a first-hand look at the forces spurring Chongqing's rapid growth transforming a once rather nondescript city into a megalopolis.
So this map um, of Chongqing is really cool. It's a 3D model that gives uh, you a bird's eye view of the city. Now you can see really clearly where the Jialing and Yangtze rivers intersect. And you can also see the rolling mountains that extend across the city and give it a really layered feel. Now, this is only part of the city center, so it's 4.5% of the entire Chongqing. The whole city is 82,400 square kilometers, which is huge. The urbanization of Chongqing is a pretty remarkable story. You could say the city was once a neglected backwater. But a little over two decades ago, China launched its Go West policy. A major element of the strategy was boosting development in Sichuan, which was a largely rural province at the time. Chongqing was named a municipality under the direct jurisdiction of the central government, joining the ranks of Beijing, Shanghai, and Tianjin. What followed was rapid development that's not showing signs of slowing down. And today, nearly half of the Fortune 500 companies have a presence in Chongqing. Chongqing is the only city in the western part of China that has rail, road, air, and water transport. And you can see from the map that there are four main transportation routes that extend from Chongqing and stretch all across the continent. Chongqing is often called the Golden Gateway to the Chinese hinterland. Lying at one end of the Yangtze River, with Shanghai at the other, the city has enormous potential for expanding trade. Guoyuan Port is the largest in Chongqing. Here, handling millions of tons of goods every year has become a well-oiled machine. And with the development of its railway, Chongqing has become a vital hub on the expanding rail freight network linking China with Europe. It's kind of surreal to think that the routes where merchants and caravans once charted a course along the famous Silk Road are now traveled by trains. It's no surprise the network is often called the New Silk Road, a modern-day revival of those ancient passages. Yeah, 终点站是德国的杜伊斯堡从重庆到新安到兰州到新疆的阿拉山口再叫哈萨克斯坦白俄罗斯俄罗斯还有波兰再到德国的杜伊斯堡那一列火车从重庆到德国然后再返程回来要
So we're here with the conductor at the very front of the train now, and he's not allowed to talk to us for safety reasons right now, so we should probably keep it down too. But I kind of feel like uh, when I was a kid and I would go into the captain's cockpit on planes, and then I would feel like I was somewhere I wasn't supposed to be. It's kind of amazing what these trains have done for Chongqing and for the rest of China. Each outgoing train carries as much as 2,000 tons of freight. As for what's making up that weight, it's everything from machinery to automobile parts to coffee beans. constantly on the move. There's an air of anticipation here, where everyone seems to have a keen eye on the future. Chongqing strikes me as an anomaly among Chinese cities. Its innovative public transport system and its role as a vital economic hub seem completely at odds with the rather laid-back, hilly, and foggy image of this inland city. Yet. Even though cranes and scaffolding may dot the skyline, Chongqing hasn't forgotten its merchant past. So much about this city feels like it appeared overnight. Here, the old is forever colliding and intertwining with the new. Before you go, I want to leave you with this tidbit. Um, Chongqing became a municipality in 1997, and that's essentially when it really began developing at lightning fast speeds and started its quick run into the future. So that means a lot of the infrastructure in the city is similar to my age, which is really crazy, and it kind of makes me appreciate everything I've seen here in a whole other light. I'm Megan. See you next time on Travelogue. <laughs>